Sorry, Alex, can you hear us? Alex, can you hear us at all? Hi, this is uh, Amanda, Alex's wife. He can't hear at all. Um, so I, I just set it up on my computer to see if it'll work. And suddenly, yeah. it just suddenly worked. Okay, good. Thank you, Amanda. If Alex is there, we'll uh, get underway. Yeah, he's, he's in another room and uh, I've got a supervision meeting in a couple of minutes. So we'll just try and figure it out. <laughs> Just a moment. Alex said he wasn't going to be very good on the technology. And, um, there you go. <laughs> okay, his is working now, so. Right, Alex, you can hear us? Yep. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, could you uh, we'll turn it up a little bit, I think? Go off mute, Alex. <laughs> Hello, Alex. Better? That's yes. much better, thank you. Right now, I'm ready on this, the um, screen okay. to talk about Colin Clark and Western Australia. Go for it. Yeah, thanks very much, David, and thanks for the invite. And, uh, thanks for uh, directing the slides. Um, this little um, paper. Thanks to David, uh, the invite. I, it, it follows my book that came out recently on uh, Colin Clark. And uh, he uh, came to Australia on sabbatical. David, can we have the first slide? Yeah, got the first slide up? Yeah. Okay, let me just look at mine. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the slide and I'll, I'll talk to the audience while I'm doing it. Yeah, my book, The Gypsy Economist, came out in March this year. And uh, there is a West Australian connection to the book, which I hopefully will show in a few minutes. Alex, um, sorry. sorry, Alex. Yeah. Um, I can't believe it, but there's a, a problem. Yeah, what's the problem? It's all right. <laughs> okay, come on, Sam. I'm good. Go for it now. So, come. Okay. so we're looking at the first slide there, of Colin Clark in Western Australia. That was a portrait I used in the book of, of the Gypsy Economist. And we'll go to the next slide. Uh, the context of this presentation is I want to show how WA played a role in actually seducing Colin Clark to leave his Cambridge job, his position in the British Labour Party and the, the British Fabian Society, and stay in Australia. Uh, he was. Uh, he was um, basically uh, seduced by the diet and the, the freedom, the classlessness, the, the institutions in, the, in Australia. Uh, he was invited out by Douglas Copeland from University of Melbourne to take a one year sabbatical doing some teaching in Melbourne. And then he arranged some extra teaching in Sydney. And the idea was that he would then go on to America to go on a little bit of a lecture tour on his new book, National Income and Outlay. He arrived in Perth in June 1937 uh, to the rather uh, desolate flatlands of Western Australia and Fremantle. I say that because I too arrived as a child immigrant way back in 1964. But as soon as he stepped ashore, there were some exciting prospects. And, and one of the first persons he met there was A.G.B. Fisher, who was a professor of economics at UWA. And, um, Clark probably just had a day, maybe two days in Perth before he went on to um, Adelaide and on disembarking in Melbourne. Um, but uh, while he was in Fremantle and Perth, uh, he would have got on very well with Fisher. And Fisher must have said, look, I'm going for a job up at, in, Australia, in London shortly and we'll probably need someone to fill my uh, vacancy. Um, but they got together. And of course, the two of them had an interest in services as a new area of economic activity. Clark had first talked about it way back in the 1930s 
And A.G.B. Fish had, had written a book on, on the clash of civilization, economic progress and the clash of civilizations, talking about how more and more economic activity would be on services, not manufacturing, not agriculture. But the, the idea of Copeland coming here with his wife and, and two children was a, a break from Cambridge, where he was a university statistician, a university statistics lecturer, uh, just to get some money because he, he wasn't paid very well at Cambridge. And the idea was, or the plan was, he would go back to Cambridge in October 1938 after going to the States. So we go to the next slide uh, called, um, uh, we go to the next slide, which is um, just who was Colin Clark. Colin Clark was a famous, world famous economist. At the time, he was quite world famous in the sense that he had been one of the great um, builders of national income and counting. It might be a forgotten figure now, but um, my book has brought back memories of him. But in 1937, because so few English economists came to him, came to Australia, his arrival was uh, announced even before it came, even when it was arranged way back in six months earlier. And uh, he was he's a minor celebrity, a, a world famous economist because of his book, two books on national income accounting. There's an association of Keynes. He was described in the newspapers as the foremost authority on national income. He was just a brief review of Clark's life. Born in 1905 to a Scottish father, English mother. His father had made a lot of money in the meatworks in Townsville in Northern Queensland as a merchant entrepreneur. Clark himself was a precocious child, went to Winchester, scholarship boy, then to Oxford. Early socialism, his first interest in chemistry was dulled and he switched over to economics. He was at Oxford from 20, five to about 28, yes, did a thesis on radiation of all things. But he was more driven into socialism, Fabian socialism, very much against his father's wishes. And his statistical prowess led to an association with GDH Cole, who was a, a sort of a mentor to a lot of Fabian socialists. And that opened doors to Lionel Robbins, who was also at Oxford, and he said you should go to LSC as a research assistant, where he met Hugh Dalton, another influential figure in his life. And his statistical prowess led to his first academic publication, which won a statistical prize from the Royal Statistical Society on the instance of unemployment. And then we go to the third slide, the prowess with numbers. Obviously, his, his uh, f faculty or his facility of stats uh, led to some celebrity and he was soon appointed to the, the Economic Advisory Council for his ability of stats and national income accounting, production statistics, etc. And he saw firsthand the squabble between Keynes and Robbins about how to deal with the Great Depression. Um, and then he had to resign from the EAC basically because MacDonald introduced him to be writing a manifesto on protectionism Clark felt, well, I'm out of here, because he was always a diehard free trader, even though when he came to Australia in the 1930s, he wavered a little bit. So Keynes arranged a university lectureship for him in statistics, and that was a marvellous investment by Keynes, because uh, Clark soon came good with two books on national income and accounting, drawing Keynes's praise that he was a bit of a genius. And Clark always wrote with great affection about his association with Keynes, his friendship, they used to call themselves Dear Maynard, Dear Colin. That was quite uh, friendly. It wasn't perfunctory. Um, Clark's, in 1937, produced his book, National Income and Accounting, where, where he made the first discovery of GNP uh, using British production statistics and census data, etc. And he was the, the, uh, the building, the path stones or the, the bricks for building National Income and Accounting. Kuznets basically got the got the glory though because he was also in, in interested in national income accounting and he was always regarded as a man who came up with gdp gross domestic product go to the third slide so here we have clark then um earning sabbatical and just instead of going to america directly he decides to go to australia probably because of curiosity probably because of the income he was offered by the university of melbourne teaching there in statistics and so he goes to uh, Australia with his young family, 
and he's teaching statistics. The, the, the sabbatical was organized partly by Douglas Copeland at Melbourne University. And after his initial foray with Fisher at Fremantle, it only takes him two months to take up the offer of additional teaching at UWA uh, in early 1938. And uh, he, he, he describes it as it would give him the opportunity of seeing this rather isolated country with a peculiar set of economic problems of its own. So he cancels the American leg of his sabbatical. Now, this is most interesting because I've always been intrigued. Why would Clark, who was still a Labour Party candidate, a position in Cambridge, a promising young man, why would Clark want to just leave all that behind and stay in Australia? And I've, I've, I've basically solved the riddle. But the, the first solution was that he was basically found Australia's classlessness and its diet and its climate, etc., very attractive. So he extended his stay in Australia for a whole year instead of just the six months as initially arranged. We know later that Clark basically went up to Queensland and he fell in love with that place and eventually he got an executive job up there for the next 15 years. But it was WA uh, and, 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 and maybe being in Melbourne and Adelaide to some extent that I first attract him to extend his sabbatical into Australia. And I've got there in that last paragraph, the space, the resourcefulness, the, the optimism of the young people. Maybe the fact also he was away from uh, Europe where the war clouds were gathering, et cetera. And um, he, what happened to, to, to jump to the conclusion, he actually was offered a, a job by the Queensland Labour Premier Forgan Smith, uh, which was more, quite fortuitous how it came about. And we go to the next slide. Clark and Fisher, as I said, would have got on like a horse and fire on the free, on the Fremantle. They talking about the same issue. In fact, there's a bit of a rivalry where who actually invented the term tertiary tertiary industry or services. Clark may have precedence there. Um, anyway, when we met in Fremantle for that day or two days, um, Fisher had already applied for a job at Chatham House in England. And of course, UWA, uh, was, he was to leave shortly thereafter. Um, UWA could have perhaps offered a job to the young Clark, but they probably didn't know who he was at that stage. And, uh, but what did happen was that Fisher arranged for Clark to come and teach for two terms in 1938 at UWA, saying that Perth was a, a fertile and attractive field for the labels of a young economist. Within two months of arriving in Australia, Clark was offered the chair at Adelaide, where, of course, Shan had gone to, um, but he, he declined. Uh, he was still sniffing around. Uh, he, had, he still was a bit uncertain about his future. But certainly, Clark agreed to, to Fisher's pr proposal to teach in UWA in 1938 for two terms. And if we go to the next slide, Clark at UWA. So by the time Clark arrives in Perth in March 1938, he's already landed himself probably the most, not the most prestigious, but the probably the most well-paid economic position in the Commonwealth and the State Public Service is to work as Premier Forgan Smith's um, state statistician, director of the Bureau of Industry, and also financial advisor to the Treasury. How that came about very quickly was that Brigden was doing that job. Brigden then was offered a job in Canberra, Forgan Smith was looking around. He had seen Clark come to Brisbane, give a lecture. The two of them must have had some interesting uh, um, introduction. But the, the man who actually secured that position for Clark was a British politician who was visiting Australia in early 1938 to, to help with the 150th anniversary of the founding of Australia. And his name was Hugh Dalton, for, later a British Chancellor of the Exchequer. Dalton was one of Clark's mentors, and he had basically told Clark, you should take this job only for a few years, maybe, because it's such a waffly introduction to putting economics into practice. So Clark basically accepted that job in February 1938 when he was over in New Zealand on a holiday and also working in Wellington, helping New Zealanders with their national income statistics. So accepting that post with uh, Forgan Smith meant that Clark had to write a fairly humble letter to Kane saying, look, I'm sorry, but I was offered such a wonderful job. And you yourself, if you were a young man, would probably 
have accepted. Um, it would have been a bit of a wrench for Clark to accept to, to write that letter and to turn his back on Keynes and Cambridge. It's something I've spent a, an academic paper on, but it was Hugh Dalton who had written a, a very influential letter to Clark saying, here are six points why you should take the Queensland job and stay in Australia for at least another three to five years. This uh, is an article I've written for a, a journal which hopefully might get published. No sooner had um, Clark arrived at Netherlands than Forgan Smith now wanted to get his economic number man uh, more accessible than just waiting till June or July. He wanted them to come in May. And so Forgan Smith wrote to the University of Western Australia Vice Chancellor saying, can you release Clark early? And which, which in fact happened. So Clark was only in Perth for only about two months. Uh, and the manner of his departure was quite intriguing also. So Clark at UWA, even though it was only a two month period, about eight weeks, he spent time teaching. Uh, he, he was putting his expertise and statistics to good use by uh, helping students. And one student he helped, who was a WA Treasury official called J.H. Goods, who um, was mentioned in a paper by uh, uh, Ray Protritus, J.H. Goods was also working on West estimating WA's state product. And actually, Goods actually later became the state statistician. And he was singing the praises of Clark. Another thing that Clark was also involved in was as a, a, an expert, giving expert evidence for the 1938 WA basic wage case, where he recommended an increase in the wage, given the, uh, that the existing wage was uh, um, not adequate for a man, wife, and two children. And as a natalist, that is someone who believes in population growth, and expanding the population base, he felt that Australia had to reverse its falling birth rate. Clark had earlier been a Malthusian, but like Keynes, he saw the merits of having a large population. And he was very renowned for this uh, population stance in the 70s. And so Clark's export, uh, export testimony, which the trade unions had arranged and invited him to do, was quite influential. And in that evidence that you can read on Trove, uh, on the National Library's Trove um, page, he derided the notion that the, the, the city was running on the backs of the farmer. He presented evidence that it was services, which was now employing most of the workforce. And he also spoke in favor of a shorter working week, which New Zealand had just introduced the 40 hour working week. We go to the next slide, Clark's evidence before the arbitration court. He also, of course, recognized the importance of agriculture, which was the, the state's um, number one export earner. And the fact that um, uh, w had to import a lot of stuff from overseas, but also import stuff from the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, he did also speak in favor of more technical education for agriculture. Uh, he was aware of agriculture. Clark had been a, a hobby farmer in England, so he knew all. He, he was quite interested in agriculture. Uh, he wasn't a, a city slicker. Um, the presiding judge praised Clark's evidence as very of. of significance and consequence in his deliberations. There was a wage rise in that, other words. Then in the same uh, April 1938, Clark uh, in a lecture, UWA lecture entitled The Economist and Rearmament, which was also given, by the way, in, in Albany, so he must have done two lectures. Uh, he attacked the advice of Co Douglas Copeland. Copeland, who was the great prima donna of the Australian economic establishment at the time, and the, the man who invented or who drew up the 1931 Premier's plan, the key architect, he was a very egotistical chap, had a lofty view of his own opinion. Clark um, basically said that Colton was wrong at, because Colton was saying, if we're going to increase defence spending, we need to cut back state spending. Clark, who felt that that was a wrong-headed advice because he could see that currently the Australian economy was beginning to go down a bit because of the Roosevelt recession of 1938. And he said there was no need to taper back state spending. So he actually had a go at his uh, Australian mentor, Copeland here, uh, saying that his advice was entirely wrong. It was in the papers, you know, it was in the media. You know, and, and Copeland, of course, was rather offended by this. Um, and um, that he'd been shown to be having a, an inad inadequate understanding of Keynesian economics. 
and he actually wrote a letter, which I haven't gone into, he actually wrote a letter to, to Clark saying, look, the Australian economists have always been united in their stand, and yet you're now being a dissident. Um, anyway, that little episode showed that Clark, who had, remember, sat at the, the knees of Keynes when he was talking about the general theory, uh, was probably more the astute, had a more astute understanding of Keynesian economics than did Copeland. And then we go to the next slide, other lectures. He also gave a lecture to the branch of the Economic Society, which he was a member of, saying there would be an increasing demand for economists, which is not a very profound point. Though, as I said here in a, in a jibe at UWA, this point was lost on the administration of UWA, who, of course, once um, uh, Fisher had left in 1937, that chair was left empty till 1941, when Frank Molden was uh, put into it from the University of Melbourne. And then another, la another address that you can look at on the trove on Colin Clark and WA is an address he gave to the UWA Econo Economical and Historical Society, which was basically talking about the state of the Australian economy, saying it was underpopulated, low birth rate, and that maybe family allowances or child endowment was necessary if Australia was to reap the benefit of the investment sunk into the place. He reminded his audience too that Australia's economy by agriculture was now largely dependent upon services. And the challenge was to make those services more efficient. And then that last point, he, he cautioned against saying that WA's primary industries were penalized by the support given to tariff protection for the Eastern states, the manufacturing that was mostly in the Eastern states. And it was not fair to say that Australia's manufacturing was totally inefficient. A few years after he said that, he totally reversed opinion, saying, in fact, that Australia should give up manufacturing. In fact, in the post-war years, he was the leading advocate against uh, industrialization, saying that Australia should just focus upon agriculture and services. And then just the last slide, Clark left Perth in the first week in May, and he left in rather dramatic fashion in the sense that Premier Forgan Smith arranged for a plane to fly him all the way from Perth to Brisbane, two-day trip, um, uh, which I thought, well, that's int intriguing because air travel then wasn't all that uh, frequent or popular. And in Perth, Clark, again, very much a very public spirited economist with lots of lectures and speeches, which are all reported on Trove at the National Library. In a few short years, he repudiated the case for places like WA in Queensland to have any viable sense of manufacturing, that these resource rich states that had always fascinated them should be allowed to not be penalized by having to import manufacturers from the Eastern seaboard. The, from what I can make out, Clark never returned to Perth for Western Australia, even though that was his first sighting of Australia. It would have been wonderful for him to have presented the Edward Shan Memorial Lecture to see what his opinion would have been um, 30 years later. I noticed in 1938, 1978, no lecture was given. So I end this little talk by saying, once again, UWA had missed out uh, <laughs> in the sense that they could have made a strategic appointment of offering Clark that job in 1938, or earlier maybe in 1937. He rejected the job at Adelaide. I think he didn't like Adelaide for some reason. Melbourne didn't offer him a job, nor did the University of Sydney. Uh, the New Zealand government were interested in that hiring him as an, an economic expert. Forg and Smith got in quick, but UWA had the first chance to, uh, uh, you know, hire him or to get him to fill that chair. Anyway, that's my little talk. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Alex. And I'll um, observe we got Michael McClure instead, so at least that's a, a, a compensation, if nothing else. Um, any questions of Alex? Pam? What is the title of the book, The Gypsy? The, the Gypsy Economist, uh, The Life and Times of Colin Clark, published by Palgrave Macmillan. I've given David Gilchrist a copy, or he's asked for a copy. He's facing the onerous chat task of reviewing it favorably. I've given him a lot of money to do this. <laughs> not that much, Alex. Not that, not that much. much. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Alex? It's just, just, oh, sorry, Lionel. 
Yeah, thanks, David. Um, hi, Alex. Thank you for the paper and congratulations on the book. I think it's terrific. Thanks. And I, I'm really pleased to see it. Um, Falk and Smith is interesting because his ideas about uh, public spending are in advance of yeah. FDRs. Yeah. I'm just wondering how much um, how much scope did Falk and Smith give Clark when he eventually recruited him? Uh, or was there were there any limits to his power? They basically got on like a house on fire. Clark had gone up to Brisbane in November 1938 to give a lecture before the Constitutional Club, which Fork and Smith chaired. And Clark was talking about uh, increasing population, about ruralism, decentralization. He was a sort of a closet distributionist then. He was moving away from Fabianism. He didn't want to, he didn't think Brisbane should go into urban manufacturing. It should use the state, the resource rich state, right? Probably the same thing you say about WA actually. And for these views were also the same as Fork and Smith. So they got on like a house on fire. So much so that Clark named his second child, Nicholas Fork and Smith. And uh, it's, so Clark was with Fork and Smith. He retired in 1942. And then he served for Edward Han, a, a, a Ted, Ted Hanlon. And he only quit the Queensland Public Service when Gare became Premier. And Gare wanted to stop the rural decentralisation uh, and, and start talking about urban manufacturing. And by that time, Clark was, he said Australia had no hope as, an urban, as a manufacturer. You know, his, his comparative advantage was in services and primary goods. Clark had always been a free trader. Only in the 30s had he relented a little bit, as we saw in that last comment there, where Clark said that manufacturing shouldn't be condemned outright, but he completely changed within a few years up in Queensland, saying that Australia should forget about manufacturing, focus upon its primary resources. So they're going on like a house on fire, and I spent quite a bit on the book on that. Thanks. We'll have to get a line or to get a full uh, response to that question. Uh, and and Richard. Um, hi, Alex. Did, did your research into Colin Clark in Western Australia shed any light on why there was so long after Fisher's departure that there was no professor of economics at UWA? Uh, Ray, Ray Petridis has written a paper about the history of UWA, uh, where, he, where, where um, and that's, that's, that's it was published in the History of Economics Review, where he talks about the history. One intriguing thing about Clark at UWA, he would have ran into a woman called Mirab Harris, and Clark at the time was an old Edwardian opinion, he had very st strange views about women in the workforce, um, but he doesn't, he, he didn't mention Mirab Harris, she was teaching economic history at the time at UWA, but Ray Petridis has got a paper on the history of UWA. Um, okay. Thanks Alex, when, when um, Colin Clark turned to writing economic history of Australia, those sort of topics. Did he have anything interesting to say on what was happening in the West? No, well, he did write a book here, which I'll just show you, which um, is called Australian Hopes and Fears. And there's not much there on, that's a sort of like an economic history and a political history of Australia written in 1958. Very prejudiced book, but there's not much there on WA at all. Just talking about the case for secession and how, how it was, um, the 1933 case for secession was driven primarily by political factors that WA was penalised by having to pay high domestic prices because of the tariff protection Australia-wide. But there's not much other than that. It, yeah, and I don't think Clark hasn't, he didn't write much about WA specifically in that two months he was here. He was more carried away by Queensland. He was seduced and tremelled by Queensland, uh, you know, almost like a fantasy state. Yeah. But maybe WA would have been his second most favourite Australian place, but he never went back there. Nor did he have any great interest in going to Melbourne once he left there. Um, I mean, he could have gone for the Giblin, the, the Ritchie chair there, but um, I suspect that by, then, by that time he'd become a, a, a Catholic zealot. 1940, he went through a spiritual crisis, became a Catholic zealot. And... Uh, even though the, the, the Giblin chair committee did consider Clark, nothing was ever put in writing to him. Alex, um, just a very quick one. Oh, I hope it's a quick one. 
Do you think at the end of the day, when you sum up, um, Clark, uh, that the promise of, or the promise that was uh, recognised in relation to his prospective career in England particularly, uh, was uh, failed to be fulfilled at the end of the day? So was he a disappointment, do you think, to someone like Kane? Well, uh, uh the, the funny thing about Clark, he was he had never got a chair, even though he was offered one in Adelaide, and just within two months of getting into Australia. And when he tried to get back to Australia to carry the, the story forward, in my book, Clark still wanted to get back to Australia by the by even in this late 1950s when he was back over in Oxford, he wanted to get back to Australia. He loved Australia, he loved Queensland, but he couldn't get a job. He applied for a job at the ANU. He applied for a job at Monash as the Dean of the new faculty. He applied for a job at the Vice Chancellor of University of Queensland. I think he also applied for a job at the University of Sydney. And those four rejections hurt him. He had Bob Santa Maria, which probably was a fateful move trying to find a job for him. Uh, La Trobe University, when it was established in 1967, I think Santa Maria made some overtures there. Probably having Santa Maria as your, as your agent <laughs> might have not counted against him. By that time, Clark had very strong opinionated views about population growth, anti-birth control, anti-malfusionism, et cetera, um, that maybe universities and think tanks wanted to steer clear of him. To end the story though, he, did, he does get back to Australia, but only as a, as a working for a Catholic think tank called the Institute of Economic Progress, and he's offered a a research, a research position at Monash, but it's unpaid, it's not paid position, just given an office, etc. So he never actually got a chair or a knighthood or any imperial honours or Australian honours. Um, but as I said in the book, maybe he just wanted to be listened to, but he never got any great sinkers for his decision to quit Cambridge. And I, I think I'd actually say in the book that that decision to leave Cambridge and, and leave behind his work on national income accounting and his future work on national income accounting and looking at different growth rates and being a, one of the great um, founders of development economics, that decision to leave Cambridge and go to a provincial outpost might have cost him uh, a, a share in a Nobel Prize or even a greater recognition in Britain or in America, etc. So it might, that decision to, to stay in Australia might have cost him uh, sort of big time taking a long term view of his career, but he never regretted what he did. Oh, one last question. I have a recollection from the early 70s of Colin Clark being quite a newspaper columnist. Yes, yes, that's right. Nation Review. Yes, he was writing for two years for Fairfax before his outspoken views. Uh, he lost that contract, but he still continued to write for the Queensland paper, the, the Courier Mail, and the Nation Review, yeah. etc. Um, but yes, he, he was very opinionated, but there was very, some of his views were very outlandish, almost provocative. Thank you. Alex, thank you very much. We appreciate you joining us and sharing that uh, presentation. Cheers. Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lunch break now. I know it's a sort of a, a short space between breaks, but we had to arrange things to, to try and um, uh, meet uh, people's calendars. If you could come back at about um, 22 um, uh, 1, we'll, uh, we'll start off dead on time at quarter 2 1 uh, with um, my paper. So that's exciting to start with. Uh, but also, we've got some um, some people from the SSA participating as well. So hopefully, I'll have the technology uh, down packed by the time. Thank you, and we'll see you shortly.